Hello, my name is Dr. Freddie Byrne. I'm a clinical psychologist working with Living with ABI, which is an organization dedicated to improving the lives of families living with brain injury through specialist psychological provision. And I'm also a member of Anchor Point, which is a special interest research group um, for supporting families after a brain injury. And I'm here to talk to you today about a piece of work that I did, um, which I've called a single session, systemically informed piece of therapy uh, with an ABI survivor. So before I get started, I will say that um, some of the content of this uh, piece of work can be distressing, that part of the person's history that I'll be talking about is uh, having lived through an experience of domestic abuse and that sexual violence was part of that as well, but that there won't be a, a great amount of detail in that, but just to, to be aware that that can be um, part of what we're going to talk about as, as well as acquired brain injury. So um, just in terms of a bit of a public health warning for anyone who might be listening. I'll talk a little bit about myself first. I'm a clinical psychologist, as I said, and most of my career has been supporting families after a brain injury or some other neurological illness or event. And I've also completed some further uh, training in, in family therapy, which is what that title systemic practitioner means. Um, and, and working systemically, which is that kind of strange word that I had at the beginning, of the presentation means that I'm interested in, in thinking about the the wider systems that people find themselves in, and that might be within their families or workplaces or wider society and culture. And that that's an important uh, context for, for understanding people in, in their distress and, and the therapeutic relationships that are built with people. And I've also named some of my own characteristics that I'm as, as you will see, I'm a white man, a white English man from a, a middle class background who's educated, got a professional title and a cisgendered man. And, and that feels something that's important as well as introducing myself in terms of my professional title, my experience, because they're part of what makes me me and my identity and with everyone who I meet in, in my work, they'll be looking at me through certain lenses because of those characteristics that I have and, and they'll shape what feels possible for me to understand and, and what might feel more difficult for me to understand as well as all my own ideas and assumptions about um, the, the, the people I'm meeting and the work that I'm doing and I think that that's something that's really important for us to be thinking about as professionals and, and to find ways where appropriate of, of talking about that with people as well. So the practice example I want to talk about is a, is a woman that I've named Lisa. All the material for the presentation is anonymized. Um, and I had Lisa's consent to, to present her story, as well as consent of the professionals involved, who, who I named later. I'll talk a bit about the, the context that I was in as well. I was based in a, a children's services and social care um, and a psychology team embedded within social care, offering mental health support to parents um, who, who are receiving services from children's services. So it's a bit long-winded. Um, Lisa was a 35-year-old white British woman from a working-class background. She was referred into our psychology service by her social worker. Um, it stated that Lisa needed to learn skills to emotionally regulate and she was the mother of two. She had a daughter who I've named Sarah, who was 13, and, and a son who I've named Daniel, who was seven. And the referral came with a, a few letters um, from over the years from her GPs. And, and there, was a, there was a lot of information in these that spoke about a, a history of, of domestic violence that spanned over 10 years. And they suggested a number of different psychiatric labels for her. Um, including a personality disorder or depression or anger outbursts. There was also some history of being referred to mental health services at different times in her life, but it wasn't really clear whether she'd ever been offered any mental health support from, from what we've been provided. 
but also kind of uh, there's maybe one one or two sentences somewhere within all that information. It mentioned that Lisa had had a road traffic accident in 2004. And what that had involved was what's called an evacuation of intracranial subdural hematoma. Um, so those very medical words, which you can always Google, as I understand it, mean that they had to remove some bleeding from within some of the um, outside layers that surround her brain. And as a clinical psychologist whose, whose background was in supporting families after a brain injury, that felt like something that was really important to me, even though it, it was something that didn't seem to have been given much importance in, in the referral itself. So what we did initially was we, um, a member of our team, got in touch with Lisa to uh, speak with, through, you know, was she aware of the referral and what were her hopes for the referral? And what became clear from Lisa's perspective is that she didn't see herself as having a mental health problem, but that she wasn't being allowed access to her children. And that was something that was really important to her um, to, to be resolved. That was the main issue of concern from her perspective. So what we did with, with Lisa's consent is we wrote to her GP and we requested a review from a neurologist. And we also offered what we call a, a single session therapy appointment for Lisa and who was her social worker at the time. And this single session therapy is, is something that had been, it's been influenced by the Bovary Centre over in Melbourne, which had developed this lovely model for supporting families after a brain injury, where people are able to, to come along, work on what's important to them, and then dip in and out and, and come back if it's helpful or if you know, later date, if they want to work on something else. So they're, they're standalone sessions, because what we found for lots of the families in, in social services is that it wasn't a good fit for them to go through an in-depth psychological assessment and then be offered a, a course of treatment, because lots of the families had, had gone through lots of assessments as being part of under social services, or lots of the parents um, and that was what we'd call them in our service parents rather than clients or service users might not have agreed with the referrer's definition of the problem um, or they might not have been in a position to engage you know with a talking therapy for, for all kinds of reasons so we developed this single session model where we could meet with the parent or the wider family and the referrer or a member of their professional team to, to think through uh, any challenges that they might be dealing with at that time and, and try and offer something. And you know, if they wanted to, they could come back for, for ongoing therapy if we thought that was helpful or other times other things were helpful. So an, an overview of the work that we did with Lisa is at the time of writing the, the article that the presentation is based on, uh, which I have a link for at the end. We'd met with Lisa for, for three of these single sessions in total. I'll explain a little bit about what that looks like. And that was with myself and two assistant psychologists who are you know, a really important part of, of this um, service that we are running. So our assistants would do some kind of uh, phone calls. So they uh, made touch with Lisa beforehand um, at the point of the referral, but also before we met for the single session to try and get a sense of what's most important for us to be talking about and working on and did they have any worries and concerns and to explain what to expect to make sure they're happy to consent and we formed what we call a reflective team so this a lot of this work that we were doing was during the pandemic and following the pandemic where we'd shifted um, in part to remote working so the vast majority of these single sessions that, that we did, and I think in the end, it, it was something around maybe 250 sessions that, that we offered to, to families over the course of a couple of years um, or met with families. Um, we, we would conduct them over Microsoft Teams. Usually what we would do is the reflective team would, would say hello at the beginning and with the family's consent, they would turn off their cameras so that they weren't overwhelmed by all these faces on the screen. And then uh, the lead therapist would speak with um, the parent and the professional. And then 
uh, the reflective team on there at certain times they'd turn their screens back on and they'd come in and share some thoughts about what they've been listening to and that would be things like different ways of understanding what's going on or strengths and resources that they witness or, or just kind of sharing their human perspective about how they might have heard um, or been moved by what they've been listening to and then we would follow up with a therapeutic letter after each session and a phone call a, a couple of weeks after that to think with the person, you know, what's going to be, has this been helpful? What was helpful? What was less helpful? And what's, what should we do next, really? And in terms of uh, this specific piece of work, I joined a couple of multidisciplinary team meetings. I wrote a letter to the family court on Lisa's behalf. And then I did a, a couple of follow up phone calls with her three and six months um, after these initial sessions. Here are some of the themes that I think emerge from the work. Uh, so I've conceptualized it in terms of finding a focus, bearing witness to experiences of abuse and reauthoring a new self story. And I'll talk a little bit more about each of these. So the first session was with Lisa and her social worker who was the referrer. And when asked what was important to talk about, Lisa talked about this idea of spitting poison as the issue that she wanted help with. And when we asked more about that, she'd say that she can shout and swear and, and say these disgusting things. So in, in being curious and wanting to hear more about this and, and wanting to be helpful to Lisa, we were drawing on some of the ideas of Michael White and some of the therapeutic practices that, that he talked about that formed this um, school of narrative therapy. So we, we held what's called an externalizing conversation. So we, we talked about spitting poison um, in, a, in a way that it's external to Lisa. So we're not exploring it as, as some problem or deficit that she has, but being curious about it, its influences in, in her life. And so that might involve questions like, when did spitting poison first come into your life? And, and what's it like when spitting poison is around? And what's it like after spitting poison has been around? And, and what emerged is this understanding that when spitting poison is around, it, it feels quite good to, to get it all out. And, and that she perhaps felt quite empowered by that in the moment. But then quickly after what followed spitting poison was these horrible feelings of shame and embarrassment that would then follow her around for a long time. And, and in talking about it, what we understood is that spitting poison had actually come into her life following this road traffic accident that she'd had in her late teens. Um, and then as part of this, she'd had a hospital stay where she'd been unable to speak completely. And then I think it was in response to a, you know, a difficult interaction with another service user in the hospital, all of a sudden she went from not being able to speak to this, this outpouring of, of swearing and shouting. And, and the, this was the first time that she could remember that the spitting poison had come into her life. And, and also what we learned is that the times when it was still around in her life was when she was being subjected to, to experiences that we as professionals conceptualize as, as being abusive. I'll talk a bit more about that abuse, but as I said at the beginning, I'm, I'm not going to be going into any explicit details, but it felt important just, just to name that that's something that we'll talk about because it's understandably can be very distressing. Um, so as part of the conversations, we prioritised and, and took an interest in, in what Lisa had survived, and we heard about a very long and distressing history of, of quite extreme physical violence that she'd experienced across her life, firstly in her family of origin, um, both before and after having sustained this brain injury, but then also from a, a long-term partner who, who'd come into her life not long after the brain injury, and who, in addition to this violence, which unfortunately did also involve subsequent injuries to her head, was part of our reason for wanting this neurology review um she he'd also she'd also experienced this very uh sounded like very cold and cal calculated abusive behavior very controlling and coercive behavior and as, as part of a professional 
speaking and exploring experiences of domestic violence. I actively inquired about a history of sexual violence, which I feel is, is always something that we should be asking about in these instances. And unfortunately, that was part of, of Lisa's story as well with this um, this ex part now then ex partner of hers. And really, it, it felt like this was something that felt really important for us to to bear witness to, to to listen to respectfully, and to validate and to be very clear that what she'd experienced wasn't her fault, that it was totally unacceptable, and that it would be expected to have a significant impact on her and that it actually felt really relevant for some of the difficulties that, that she was experiencing and, and this this spitting poison that she she spoke about and wanted to work with and and what may have been conceptualized by the referrer as emotional regulation difficulties. And I and I felt strongly that the institutional abuse was something that had gone on for Lisa and, and was still going on at the time partly because she'd been under a major trauma centre and then had been sent back to, to live with her family again with um, really then having a very limited understanding of, of brain injury and how the t- nature of the injury that she'd had could affect her. And, and for Lisa to have had a very limited understanding of that and then to have kind of had to then navigate her life with very limited um, kind of safeguards in place around a financial settlement that she'd received following this accident. And that had essentially, in my opinion, then led her down this road of uh, being constantly referred to mental health services and, and come to the attention at times of the criminal justice system and, and then to, to children's services, but where there was a, a complete absence of any understanding that this is a, a woman who sustained a, and survived a brain injury and that this will have to some extent you know predictable and significant effects on her and you know that with reasonable adjustments and understanding that she could be supported in in a way that empowered her and, and I didn't feel that that was something that was going on so the the third theme from the the work is this idea of reauthoring a new self story so again i'm i'm drawing on a term from narrative therapy here which is this idea that we construct our identities our, our self stories from the stories that that we hear from other people around us that as human beings we're we're meaning making creatures and that through storytelling that's a key way that we understand ourselves and we understand the world around us and that you know for, for us as holding positions of privilege as professionals that we have a responsibility to think about you know what are the stories that we're constructing with people and about people and, and what kind of identities are we are we offering people within those stories and so i was very clear at the end of the coming to the end of our first meeting of this is how i understand what's been going on which i think was a very different way that the, the social worker who'd referred lisa to our team had been understanding her and that, that lisa had been understanding herself in the context of everything that she'd been through and that she'd survived and i said that i, I feel that the brain injury that she's had has affected her language functioning and her ability to to manage um you know what she says and how she says it particularly in situations that are very stressful. And I felt that she had been and was being subjected to significant abuse. And that part of that abuse was that she was being actively provoked to the point of harassed and and terrorized, really to the point where it was so difficult to manage how she was feeling. And then professionals were, were viewing it in terms of what's wrong with her rather than what she'd been through. And I felt that what she needed here was a professional network that that understood uh, brain injury and that understood domestic abuse and that would make reasonable adjustments, which would include uh, not having to have any contact with this ex-partner who was still actively trying to abuse her. And that in any part of any plan to reunite with her children, that it it may be helpful if her children are helped to understand brain injury and, and how that might be relevant for, for their mum and for their relationships with their mum. And I, I wrote a letter to the family court sharing this was my opinion and I attended some professional meetings to, to say this is 
this is how I understand what's going on and what's needed here. In terms of what happened next, um, Lisa was allocated a new social worker, um, Harini, who um, has, has given some feedback towards the end of the presentation and who is happy to be named. Uh, and I certainly think that was to Lisa's benefit. And she was very able to quickly support um, Lisa to reunite with her, her youngest son, Daniel. And when we completed these follow-ups with Lisa, um, what we found is that these mental health difficulties that had been initially reported didn't seem to be present anymore. And you know, initially from the first meeting, we said, you know, it might be helpful to have a trauma-focused therapy, which involved processing some of these difficult memories associated with the abuse that she's experienced because she was experiencing this, these kind of lots of you know, symptoms, if we call them that, but certainly this sense of kind of hypervigilance and extreme physiological arousal. But what we found at follow-up is that these experiences had gone away and it didn't, they didn't seem to be uh, necessary for Lisa to engage with any ongoing psychological support at that time. And that was consistent, not just with Lisa's self-report, but with Harini's feedback on, on what it was like working with Lisa. And at the time of writing the article, Lisa was still awaiting contact with her daughter, Sarah, which was sort of more of a complicated situation than reuniting with her youngest son. And what we offered is that um, if and when she were to reunite with her daughter, that we could offer some further sessions with them to support them. Some feedback here from two assistant psychologists that worked with myself and with Lisa. And I think that one of the strengths in, in working in this way is that we we worked really hard to, to show up emotionally for, for the people that we were working with and, and to allow ourselves to to be moved by people's stories and, and to be and to express that in a way that I, I don't think many people had 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 as, as part of the many kind of meetings and professional relationships that they developed in, in, in social care in the service that we were in. And Harini helpfully offered some feedback to us as, as well. And it was really lovely to, to see that Lisa was being viewed in this strength-focused strength lens and that um, she felt that, that she benefited from these sessions that, that we'd had and that that had had a positive effect on her parenting as well. And then Lisa was, was generous enough to give us some of her feedback as well. And I think what really stands out for me is just um, how much of a difference quite a small thing made, actually just helping her to understand these difficulties in the context of the brain injury and the domestic abuse that, that she'd experienced. So again, it became about what's happened to her rather than about what's wrong with her, which was very different to the discourses that had emerged in her family and in professional networks as well. And, and lovely to hear that she felt that that had a positive relationship on a uh, positive effect on her relationship with her son. So for me, this was a, a very powerful, moving piece of work that, that really stands out in my mind, even, even years later now. It felt really important that I was had thought about and was thinking about issues of power, issues of, of gender and ability. I was you know, very conscious that I was holding multiple positions of privilege in, in relation to, to Lisa as a, a neurologically intact, middle-class, educated, profess professional man, you know, meeting with her in, in a significant position of power um, where you know she'd, she'd had multiple experiences of what I would call disabilism. And, and that left me feeling really cross on, on her behalf. Um, and, and it felt really important to, to advocate for her as, as part of this work that, that this wasn't her fault and that she deserved something different and that actually if she was getting the right support, then I think she would have had a very different outcome. And I think that that was something that we saw as part of the work. I think a drawback of the work is that we, we didn't collect any quantitative outcome measures. We did try to, but I think that um, 
some of the nature of Lisa's conversational style and the time limited nature of the work just meant that it was just taking up too much time to, to go through these outcome measures with Lisa. And we thought, you know, we, we can complete them, but this is going to take up most of the session. And, and really, it feels like these outcome measures are for us and for our service rather than Lisa. So we, we chose to focus on what was most important to her. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure to, to speak with you all today. Um, here are some of the, the social media accounts linked to Anchor Points. So I hope that you'll take a look. And at the bottom, there's also a link where you can access the article that this presentation is based on. Thank you very much. <laughs>